Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Coupal. I am a member of the education team at MongoDB. Welcome to the talk, a complete methodology of data modeling for MongoDB. A few years ago when I worked with relational databases, my team had a process. We would start by getting the stakeholders together, ask the question to help us understand the domain, then go back to our desk, draw the ER diagram, write some code, and apply some denormalizations. Fast forward a few years later, we have these modern and agile databases that let you start developing quickly. However, some of us still want a methodology to help design the schema. This is what this talk is about, introducing a simple and flexible methodology to help you model your data. This presentation is divided into four sections. In the first section, we'll highlight the differences between a document database and a tabular database. Then we'll introduce our modeling methodology which is at the core of this presentation. We will illustrate the methodology with a complete example. And finally, we'll spend a little bit of time with the last phase of the methodology, which is to apply schema design patterns. Let's talk about the differences between a document database and a tabular database. These are very important to understand, so you built a good mental model when modeling for MongoDB. Note that I use tabular to refer to what many call a relational database. I prefer using tabular because it's a better description of traditional relational databases, where the data is stored in tables. As for relationships, they're not exclusive to tabular databases. MongoDB is very good at expressing relationships. As a matter of fact, it may even be better than traditional relational database, as it offers more different ways to express relationships. Document databases are based on the document model. We can summarize the document model by the following five attributes. Data is represented as key values. Polymorphism allow documents with different shapes to coexist side by side. Subdocuments and arrays to support relationship between entities. And a representation that is easy to process and read. The format is called BSON, which is very similar to JSON. You can liken a document to a row in a table. To go from the row to the document, you would start by extracting the values in the row. These values become the values in the document. The names of the columns become the names of the fields. Putting this together, we have a simple document. Because each document carries its list of fields, document can have different list of fields. We refer to that as documents having different shapes. An interesting thing with a table is that columns usually have a one-to-one -one relationship. An alternate model is to have two tables with an explicit one-to-one -one relationship between them. So if we were to model the top table with a document, it will easily translate to this simple representation. Translating the two tables model will still result in a single document. However, we can use a sub-document to group the information for the engine entity. Note that we could also use this to model the one at the top, if we would have seen that there was an engine within those fields. One cool thing about using a logical subdocument is that you can return the whole subobject without knowing how it's structured. For example, here we're selecting or projecting only the engine from the document. The engine could have a different shape, different fields. For example, it could be an electric engine and will still be returned by the same query. Another type of relationship is the one-to-many, which is often modeled with two tables and a foreign key in the tabular world. For example, the primary key for a car, year 007, is also the primary key for a MongoDB document. However, because we'll embed the one-to-many relationship between the car and the wheels, inside the document, we don't need a foreign key in the document. The wheels are simply embedded in the car. An analogy would be that storing a car in a traditional relational database is breaking it up and putting the parts on different shelves. With MongoDB, the car remains as a whole. So this is an example of SQL query to retrieve the car where we have a bunch of joints that will go on the different shelves and assemble all the parts to return it to the application. 
With MongoDB it's very simple. We just need something to identify the car and the whole car will come out at once. With MongoDB what is used together in the application is stored together in the database. Let's look at the first example. We're going to model a blog here. I'm going to have users write articles. Articles get comments that are also written by users and or articles can be categorized and receive tags. If we're going to model that in the tabular world, there will be only one solution that would be the one that respect the third normal form. With MongoDB and the document model, there is different solution for the same problem. Let's say we want a solution that is oriented toward making queries for users. We would have a main collection of users in which we would have the articles for the user and then all the information about the articles themselves. So this is pretty simple. Another solution may be, well, let's say that we have a system that's making a lot of queries on articles the main entity could be the articles in which we're going to put the information about the user and also all the information about the articles. So in this case we get duplication of user information. Well, if this is not something we want to have, a third solution is again oriented toward articles where we keep all the information about the articles within this collection but have a separate collection for the users. In this case we do avoid having duplication for users. So which approach is better here? The two solutions can be valid. The question is how are we going to use the data? What are the queries? Let's look at another example. We're going to model a social network. So the first solution we're going to keep all the images for a social network inside one large collection for all, for all submitters to put their image in. So we have Eve here who's coming back from her trip to Italy. She's posting some pictures. We have Oscar who likes to stay in Hawaii and put pictures of his island. Goes also in the same collection. And then one of their friends is coming and is reading all the pictures from the people who's following. So that's our first solution. We could have a second solution where we think it's better to keep the images per submitter. So we're going to get the first document here that we're going to use and put all the picture when Eve comes back from her trip and we're going to do the same thing with Oscar and when their friend is logging in and wants to see all the pictures we're going to go and read from both profiles. We could have a third solution where we're going to orient our documents toward the followers. So in this case so the first friend is going to get pictures from Eve as she's come back from a trip and Oscar is going to put also his picture there but Oscar has also another follower so we'll have to copy this image into his other friend so when their friend come in they can read their images from their profiles so the interesting thing about this third solution is we pre-aggregated pre the data let's start that again the interesting thing about this third solution is the data is pre-aggregated which means we're going to get slower writes. In the case of Oscar we need to write the images at two places. It's going to take more storage and we're going to get duplication. So those are not very interesting attributes obviously of the system. However, we're going to get faster reads when the users come in and they want to see the pictures on their home page. So if the most important attribute of our system is to get a good user experience for a user who come to the system and logged in, it has to be really fast, obviously that solution C would be the best. So again, like the previous example, in order to be able to tell which one is the best model, we need to understand what the workload of our system is. So if you were going to create a schema for the tabular databases. The first thing you would do is probably get in a room, define your schema, then you go write the app, write the queries. As for MongoDB, as we've seen, it's important to really understand the workload first. So we identify the query, then define the schema. So basically we're inverting those main two steps. 
the initial schema you're going to get for a tabular database you try usually to get to something that respects the third normal form and that's going to give you one possible solution as MongoDB as we've seen there could be many possible solutions this is why it's important to understand the workload the final schema it's likely to be denormalized with the tabular database. Uh, every time you want to improve the performance, you usually go that route. MongoDB is likely to have fewer changes because we do care more about performance right at the beginning. Now for schema evolution, it's, as you know, very difficult to make complex modification on uh, tables. It usually will uh, require downtime. As for MongoDB, you can make nearly any kind of modification in the schema without downtime. And at the end, the query performance, you no, know, you don't have a choice. If you're going to make a query that go and touch seven tables, it's going to take time. There is no magic there. It's going to take a lot more time compared to something like MongoDB. If all the data is aggregated together in one document, then you have to do only one read to retrieve it. That brings us to the second section of our talk, the methodology. But before we look at the different phases of our methodology, let's just look at something really important. It's probably the main trade-off when you model for something, not just for databases, but for a lot of things. You usually have to choose between simplicity and performance. So you would choose simplicity if you have a very small project, if you have an effort that is done by one or two people. On the other hand, if you have a large system with a big team, you probably want to spend a little bit more time up front to design your system and performance will probably be a lot more important because it's going to have a bigger impact on larger systems and obviously you have the all in between of the spectrum. Now, if you don't know where you are on this axis for your project, I will say err on the side of simplicity. It's always easier to fix things and improve performance of your code or section or the database than it is to remove complexity out of a project. Our system will have different inputs. So, in order to design it, maybe we will get some scenarios from a requirement document. We may have production logs if we're migrating this system from a relational database to MongoDB, or we add a prototype, so that generated logs we can use. Uh, we may have a business domain expert, someone who really know uh, how things should be working, that we can interview, get some information out of him, and hopefully we also have a data modeling expert that's going to help us put everything together. So feeding some of these inputs into our first phase, as you may have guessed, our first phase is describing the workload. As we said earlier, we need to understand that in order to be able to model correctly. So we're going to use the opportunity in that phase to look at things like sizing for resources, machine, data. But the most important thing will be to list all the operation. And for those operations, we're going to quantify them and qualify them. So one more thing also that's very interesting to get out of that first phase is the assumptions. The assumptions will be things that you're not sure what they may be, but you're going to still try to make a number on it or something. Let's say we may say that the relationship between an entity and something else will be max at 1000. Well, if it happened in the course of the development of the project or later in operation that 1000 end up being a wrong number, it should really be a million. Well, that's a flag. We should go back to uh, the board and see the impact of that change on the overall schema and see if a lot of changes should be done. So once we get that, now we're going to go and model the relationship. Uh, we're going to identify the relationship, like an ER diagram if you want, and we're going to quantify them. Quantify quantified part is interesting here because as I said you may have a relationship that goes from 1 to a million, 1 to 10 million. Uh, in the world of big data this is frequent and that has the main impact on your design. So if you kind of you know identify those early you're gonna make better decision. And then you're gonna answer the most important question in the modeling uh, phase uh, which is, should you embed or link data? So if for every single relationship of two pieces of data, you can keep them together in the same document or you can put them in two different collection. And that's what you're going to resolve in that phase. So coming out of that phase, you're going to have a model. You're going to have a number of collection. 
it's not going to match your number of tables. Hopefully you're going to have much, much less collection that you, had, you, know, you would have had tables or entities. But it still feels pretty much relational. And this is where the third phase, which is applying patterns, is going to come into the picture. A uh, pattern will be a transformation that will help you improve performance or make your data easier to access. So what we need to do there is to be able to recognize the situation in which we should apply a pattern and then apply it. As we said earlier, we want that to be a flexible methodology. It's very easy to use MongoDB. You don't really need a process. You don't need to create tables and anything. You can just go and start writing code, put stuff in the database. So you can apply this model and still keep it very simple. Uh, if you are going to strive really for simplicity uh, and you're out of your first phase, you may not have to identify all the operation. As long as you identify the most or frequent operation, that's going to be really helpful. You'll probably embed nerdy everything, use very little references. Embedding tend to simplify stuff. Uh, you have like larger object, more information, it just may take a little bit more resource, uh, more memory, take a little bit more time to be sent back to the client, things like that. But it's going to be as, it's going to be simpler, much easier to manage. And then as for the patterns, I said these are transformation usually for performance. They do bring some aspect of maybe duplication, so uh, you're probably not going to use many of them. On the other hand, if what's important for you is really performance, then you should do all the phases with all the steps. You should really identify all the operation, quantify all of them, and qualify them. And you'll probably get a mix of embedding and linking in order to not use too much resources and apply more pattern. And as you may guess, there's an in-between where you don't need to do everything, you do whatever is right for, for the level of your project. So that brings us to the third section of our presentation. What we're going to do, we're going to start the franchise of coffee shops. We're going to name our coffee shop Beyond the Star Coffee. We're going to start with 10,000 stores in North America. If that works well, we're going to expand to the rest of the world. Where key to success will be have the best coffee in the world, the best technology. And how do you get the best coffee in the world? Well, this is an example from a little coffee shop in Sydney. They have that on their website. It's a pretty, you know, very strict and precise process in order to create coffee. Everything is measured correctly, perfectly. So we're going to be inspired by that. But we can also have very intelligent coffee machine. So we'll be able to measure everything we saw on the previous page. And we'll send this information to our servers, make some analysis. We'll also have intelligent shelves in all the stores. So every time we deliver coffee, put it on the shelf, or remove a bag in order to put it in the machines, we'll sense that something has changed in the shelf and we'll send a signal back to our system. So we'll always have the real, uh, a real measure of the inventory. And then we're going to use the best intelligent data storage that is out there. As you all know, it's MongoDB. OK, so our first phase is to describe the workload. So we will first get the list of operation. For example, um, every time, as I said, the weight on the shelf is changing because we added or removed coffee, we're going to send a write to our system and we're going to use that data we receive, run some queries once in a while to see how much coffee we have to ship to all the stores in the next days, do some analytics on that. I'm not sure what we can find, but there's maybe something interesting. We're going to get the best data scientists. I'm sure they'll find very interesting stuff. Uh, then we also need to send write to our system every time we make a cup of coffees with all the data that we want to capture about temperature, weight and all that. And the same data analysis will be doing some, we're going to crunch some numbers on our coffee cups just to be sure that we're on top. We always have the best coffee and always try to improve it. And we need to be able to read some of our data also to help our franchisees. So that would be basically, you know, in this little example, some of the important queries that we need to care for our system. Now, the next part is to quantify and qualify those. 
So going back to our first query, if we look at the number of times an event happened for a shelf, number of shelf we have per store, number of store, calculate all that, it gives us about one write per second, which is obviously not much. Uh, we can say maybe as long as this write is done in one second, the hardware, the shelf will be fine. And we will also label this write as critical. This is what I qualified, uh, I, I qualified as qualification, is some aspect on the queries, the operation themselves. So I'm saying this is a critical write because we don't want to lose that write. Uh, whether there's you know, a problem with the system going down, whether there's a problem with the network, if we don't get the right number of uh, coffee bags per shelf, then we may end up in a bad situation. So it's really important to keep this, this information safe all the time. And for those of you who have a little bit of experience with MongoDB, you know that this basically would translate to ensure that this write get done with the right majority concern. So second query here, we're going to be running something on our side that may take a lot of time, up to 60 seconds, it will be fine. It's kind of a report to just tell us where we have to get the data. What's important here is we want to be sure we get the latest information. We want to say, hey, you know, I don't want something that is like a few seconds, a few minutes late because maybe there's a bag of coffee that was just removed and so I want to be as close as possible when I make my decision of much coffee I'm going to ship. As for running analytics uh, or analysis, they, they, they don't really need to get the coffee, uh, the information about the, the data to be absolutely up to date. The data may be stale a little bit. I'm not sure exactly what the staleness acceptable here could be like, you know, a few seconds, few hours, uh, depending what they're trying to do. But they will also be doing a lot of collection scan on the data to crunch all that. And that is a very good indicator that maybe you should not be running those queries on your main server where you have your right workload. So this is really like an indicator that you may want to have an additional node just to run analytics. And probably the most important query most of you would have guessed that would have been this one. This is obviously the one that will generate the most traffic is if we send a right event for every single cup of coffee we're making. Now one thing to notice here is that this is a non-critical right because the only thing I'm going to be doing with da that data is some analysis. And if even if I lose one or two writes uh, because there's you no know, network failure, well, it's not going to affect me that much. So I could label those as non-critical write, meaning that maybe my coffee machine doesn't have to have an acknowledgement that the write will be protected forever. So it's just that data can be treated s differently. So it's important to really understand that as you're doing your initial design. No, these decisions may help you a lot. So one thing to note here is that the previous one, uh, line four, is the one that generate the most write, but it gener it, it's not OK to just look at the load and expect a load that's going to be constant. Usually, if you want to size something correctly, you really have to think about the peak period. So if you're in e-commerce, peak period per be per day, but it may be like the few days before Christmas or Thanksgiving, uh, Black Monday, uh, Black Friday, whatever they call them. As here, what we're going to say is that 30% of our cup of coffee will be done within one hour of the day. So we're going to have a, like a rush hour where 30% of them are made. So using that as the new maximum value, then we see what the peak is going to be, which is 833 writes per second. Again, this is very small. MongoDB can handle like tens of thousands of writes per second on, with a single replica set. So that gives us a good indication that we don't need sharding for this system, at least to sustain the, the, the writes we're going to be making on our disks. So taking that query here, uh, we may want to dig a little bit more into it, especially if we uh, were trying to really optimize everything. So we may have other qualification or quantification to add to it. The other thing I want also to uh, size when I'm there is the resources I'm going to need for the system. So we have two writes coming in, which means we're going to have two type of data that's going to take some space. So we have our coffee cups 
and every time also the shells have an event they're going to send a signal so again we crush the numbers uh, let's say we want to keep one year of data we we'll multiply by the amount of bytes per coffee cup or waiting we end up with 370 gigabyte of space for the cup of coffee and three points event for the whiting and this like the queries this is a pattern you're going to see very often there's usually one uh, part of the data that will really overshadow the rest and that's the one if you want to do optimization on your space you basically just look at to just have to look at the cup of coffee the waiting I don't become as important another thing interesting here is that I said one year of data and one year of data give us 370 gigabyte which is again probably something that a single replica set will be able to handle pretty well uh, one of the uh, rule of thumbs for MongoDB is if you don't have a terabyte of data you don't really need to shard for uh, performance usually so this will be under that but this is under that also because I have one year of data let's say we would have said that it's important to have 10 years of data then we have been 3.7 terabyte and in that case you know we probably have to shard the system so here you can make also a very important decision if you size your things correctly at the beginning it's like well is it really important for the complexity of project to have a sharded cluster do we want to pay also the price of having all those machines for 10 years of data in this case making hard decision at the beginning saying I'm not going to keep everything that is exact that is enough for what I need to do will probably save you a lot of money on the long run so once we get that we have a better understanding of what our system is about we're going to go to the next phase which is identify the relationship so it's not because you're with MongoDB that relationships are not important. It's not because, you know, we call it NoSQL, but you always have relationship between piece of data. So let's look at an example where we have actors playing in movies and we have reviews for those movies. So the first two, an actor name and the date of birth, these two have a one-to-one -one relationship. And often, you know, it's kind of uh, assumed, but the one-to-one -one relationship end up being in the same entities but the relationship is still there still exists as for the relationship between the movie title and the actor name those are many to many and those get put in different entities and we see the many to many relationship between the two the reviews apply to movies so we have a one to many so if we're going to do that with MongoDB we still need to understand those because what it's going to translate in here we have we still have many to many relationship between our actors and movies but the one to many relationship between the movies and reviews get implemented as an array as we've seen earlier in the first section of this talk so I mentioned that this is probably the most important question you have to answer if you're going to embed and or reference uh, your relationships so there's three type of relationship one to one one to many many to many and what's the implication of embedding versus referencing well when you embed for all of them you basically end up doing just one read and you get all your data so this is much faster it's also simpler it avoids doing joins but the one case to be careful is when you have a many to many relationship if you embed the information for example if we're going to embed actor names inside a movie we would duplicate the name of the actors uh, but it doesn't really matter usually when a movie is released and there's a bunch of actors it's not that the actor information is going to change if you keep the name they may change their name but you know you may want to keep the old name that they had when they basically that movie on the other hand when you reference you end up having to do many reads because now you have to read two parts you need to read the two entities uh, but you need you end up doing smaller reads you may not need to read everything in both sides and collections because not everything is grouped the part you don't need may not be accessed so you may save on the amount of data you're reading but you're going to do more IOPS basically So looking at the different entities that will come out from our first section, we'd have something like coffee cups, the stores, the coffee machines, the shelves, the weightings, and the coffee bags. Those are basically the things that we made query on. So an easy model could be something like that, where we're going to keep uh, everything in the store. So the store has coffee machines and that shelves on which we have coffee bags. 
I'm going to keep two other collections also for coffee cups and waiting and the reason those are separated here is because they also have a different life cycle. We said that this data is going to expire in one year. So data that expire usually it's a good sign that you pre want to have a separate collection for those. At this point this is still pretty relational. So this is where we're going to go and apply or patterns to make things easier to access and faster. And that brings us to the last section of our presentation, the patterns. So this is not to talk about schema design patterns. I'm going to go very quickly on some of them. We do have a lot of other references. Uh, the first one is a series of blogs that Ken Alger and I wrote last year. So one blog per pattern. Uh, the patterns are heavily defined also in our online class M320 that I'm modeling for MongoDB. And there's also another talk happening at this conference, MongoDB Live 2020, which is advanced schema design patterns that Justin Labrec and I are doing. Uh, Justin is one of our like, best consulting engineer out there. He uh, goes to customer and implement solution for them. So he's been using these patterns many, many times. So he's going to have like a very down to earth example that he used at a specific customer. And we're going to run through that. And he's going to be applying patterns in different sections. It's pretty cool. So please uh, go and look for this, this talk. It's a basically comment complimentary talk to the one we're doing right now here. So the first pattern I want to go over is the schema versioning pattern. So let's say we wanted to migrate a schema from a version 1 to a version 2 in a relational database. For example, let's say that we have people and we keep track of their favorite restaurant. Well, we decide that the system is very successful. We should keep track of more than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of a bunch of favorite things that our users have. So favorite restaurants and favorite dish. So we're basically going from a scalar field to adding two tables, uh, having a one-to-many relationship, both of them, to our people. So that's a pretty heavy transformation. If you were going to do that with a relational database, uh, that would be um, a little bit complicated. So the migration would look a little bit like that. We would have a first version of our schema. We would break down the system. We would reformat that first table to have less information in it, which we would migrate to our new tables. And when everything has been migrated, that's or version 2 of the schema, we could reopen the service. Now doing the same with MongoDB, using the schema versioning pattern, we would go from documents version 1 on the left to version 2. So in terms of changes in the document, the first thing is we would track the version. We could just by the shape trying to infer the version, but it's pretty easier if we just like label the version inside. And then we will make the change from a favorite restaurant to a favorite list of restaurant and dishes. So the key thing here is that with MongoDB, because you have polymorphism, you can have documents that have different shapes at a given time. Well, we don't, we're not restricted to one schema version for the old, the old database. Every document can carry its own version. And the impact of that is that if you're going to do a migration with MongoDB, you would start with a bunch of documents in your collection. And then that's what you want to have. You want to have all your documents in version 2 when the system can be functional. But we're going to migrate version 1 of the document, then migrate version 2 of the document, then migrate version 3 of the document. And the key here is to have the application be able to read and process both shapes, which is very easy. It's polymorphous. We already know MongoDB can read documents of different shapes. So you just have to have the application who can understand the logic of these two different shapes and do whatever is needed. 
So that basically gives us a no downtime situation. And this is a pretty complex migration if you look at it. We went from having a scalar field going to two new relationship, one too many being added in the schema. And you could also have created a new collection. It's, you know, it, it can be much more complex than that if you want. So the key thing here is be, being able to do that migration. You're more in control. You, you can decide when you're going to do it. You can take the time you want to do it. Um, you can use a batch of data. You can use the application to, on the right, every time it has to make a change, read the previous document, make the change, and store back the document. So you're really in control, and you can do basically any kind of migration, the right migration you want, without downtime. This, to me, should be like a sufficient reason to justify that you want to use MongoDB on a project. Another pattern we have is the computed pattern. And this one, we see it apply when we have a lot more read operation than write operation. Um, for people who come from the rational world, this is a little bit like a view, but it's better. You'll see why. So let's say I'm doing, for each write I'm doing, I'm doing a thousand read. And the reads need to sum some information. So if you look at this diagram, what we're doing here, it's a little bit silly because the summation of all the read operation is exactly the same thing. So we may be doing a thousand times the same sum in, in average. So this is a lot of wasted resources. The other way you can do it is when on write operation, you're going to add to your collection the new piece of data. You're going to do the sum. And then we're going to take the result, which could have been the view, but we're going to store it at the right place, not just in a view, but if it's a document, that there's a document that already exists that should receive that sum. For example, it could be a document that characterizes a movie, and we could put the total revenues of that movie directly in. We don't, know to go, we don't need to go to another source. We do have a document now that has everything in it. So you're going to save a lot of resource here because every time we have a reader, we don't have to redo the sum. Another pattern we have is called the subset pattern. And that has to do with management of your RAM, basically. Uh, we use uh, the term working set to represent all the data that you need to keep in memory all the time indexes because you access it very often. And for any kind of system, you want to keep things in RAM. You don't want to go to disk if it's possible. Well, the issue may come on the fact that here, for example, we have like four large documents that we need to keep in memory, but there's only space for three. So every time we need to access the fourth one, we'll need to drop one from memory, go to disk, bring this one. So that's not very effective. So a better way would be to look at the big documents and see which part of it that you really need all the time. So we're going to break this document into what's accessed frequently and what is not. So now if we look at the new diagram with that, the four documents that we need to keep in memory, because there's a smaller section of it, they fit in memory, and then we have additional memory to cycle in the page that we don't read that often. So that's going to be much more performant. So that breakout there can be done two different ways. It could be done on a one-to-one -one relationship. So I'm going to take a document and just remove things at the root, put it somewhere else, and have the same ID or primary key on both collections. Or I can also use a one break or one to end relationship. I have a document in which I have an array. I'm going to take this array and put it somewhere else. But for performance reason, keep part of it, the subset, back into the first object. That would be an example that we take um, a movie document in which we have all the actors. But we're going to take the actors, put them in a different collection but still keep maybe the top 10 actors in the main movie document. And if you think about it, that's usually the right use case. People who go look at information about a the movie, they're interested by the top actors, not by the thousand actors and different cast members who were in a movie. If they are, you know, you can make a second query. So this is what the subset about is breaking the information, breaking a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many relationship into two collections. The bucket pattern. This one is usually or always used by Internet of Things solution, where you know you could have 
one big document that keeps all the information for one given device or I could also create a little document for every single measure that my system receives. So the bucket pattern is seen as an in-between solution where I'm going to take not all the data but not just one and put that together in what we call the bucket. So it will look a little bit like that. For example, this one here is a bucket per day. So I'm going to have one document per device per day. And if you look, there's an array for the temperature measure for that day. Um, you could also do the same per hour. So if you look at my date, now it includes the hour. So I'm going to get one document per device per hour. What's the right granularity? What should be the size of your bucket? One thing that I usually look for is, you know, you do a lot of aggregation on that. And the first thing you end up doing is on one operation to uh, take the arrays and extract values, you could be basically uh, went a little bit too far in the bucket. You may want to have a smaller bucket. That's one thing. The other thing is if you're going to do computation using the compute, uh, computed pattern and put these data somewhere, well, you probably want whatever you're trying to compute uh, to match the document. So if you're interested in keeping average of temperature per hour, well, having documents that have buckets per hour would be also the right granularity. So if we apply these patterns to our solution here, well, in schema versioning, you see in number of fields of things to do is pretty simple. You just add one field. It's more the procedure that you're going to be doing in order to do your migrations. Computed, I may want to keep the last weighting that I receive uh, from a given store. And I may have may want to keep the total cup of coffee uh, that have been done by a given machine. This may be important for maintenance. So instead of recalculating all the time, once in a while, I'll go update that. I may want to keep a subset of the last 30 days for my cup of coffee. Remember here we have a separate collection where we, could, could we keep all the cup of coffee, but maybe it's interesting in the, just with a store to keep that information so we don't have to go to the other collection and we can quickly show something. And I may want to use a bucket. I didn't in that case, we wanted to generate a lot of data. So we decided that we're going to send single writes for every single um, cup of coffee and keep separate documents make things a little bit better but it, that could be something we could change we could decide that hey no the coffee cups should be in a bucket it would be more efficient for what you're trying to do so looking at all the different patterns that we have out there and uh, listing them across the different use cases uh, that we often see at MongoDB uh, we come up with that matrix here this is not uh, exact science uh, it doesn't mean that if you're using Internet of Things, for example, and there's no check mark that it's something, a pattern that would not be used for that. This is just that this is probably the most likely patterns you're going to see for a given use case. So you should be extremely familiar with those patterns. But in reality, it's not that difficult. You should be familiar with you know, all the different patterns that we have listed there. That brings us to the conclusion. So the things I want you to remember from this talk the first thing is really understand the difference between the document database and the tabular database. So you can have a good mental model when you're working on your schema. And the second thing is the main step to do modeling. Very important to understand that you need to understand your workload at the beginning. You need still need to understand the relationship and model them and then apply patterns for getting uh, better performance. And before we leave, I just want to remember everyone, we do offer classes on everything MongoDB from aggregation, replication, sharding, data modeling. It's at university.mongodb.com. Class are free. This is the best resource to learn about MongoDB. So again, thanks for listening. See you around.